Hi there. It's another wonderful Sunday. Um, and here we go with George Muller, part eight, apparently. Um, so we know now all about George Muller, a lot about him. Here's the picture of him. We know that he's building these without any money, apart from his trust in God. He's building these orphanages up on Ashley Down outside Bristol. We know that he's giving money uh, to a number of missionary organizations, including the China Inland Mission once it was created. Um, and we also know that he's sending out uh, thousands of Bibles uh, to all sorts of countries and gospel leaflets. Um, and at the end of every year, he's also sending out these wonderful answers to prayer, uh, which is his record of all that God has done for them over that year. Um, and we said last week that this answers to prayer reached some young people. And this is the story of what happened, the really remarkable story of what happened. So that, that answers to prayer was, it fell into the hands of this young man. Um, there he is, he's called James McQuillan. He lived in Northern Ireland um, and he was um, not a particularly good guy, uh, not a particularly bad guy, but he was quite a character and was known locally, but he wasn't yet a Christian, but he was worried. Uh, he was worried because he uh, wanted to become a Christian because he thought, when I stand before God one day, I want to know that my sins are forgiven. He felt as well that he knew about God, but didn't know God. And then through meeting someone, he becomes a Christian. Um, he uh, receives God into his heart. Um, his, he knows that his sins are now forgiven and something remarkable begins to happen inside him, much to his astonishment. He's a very changed man. And this becomes known locally and he becomes a real shining witness like we've talked about with, with uh, George Muller. His heart was really, really set on fire, this young man, James McQuillan. And uh, at that time, he was reading a Christian magazine and it advertised uh, a book, a, a, a sort of leaflet. Uh, and, he, and it said it was about a young man from Germany who was running orphanages outside Bristol without any money, just help from God. And um, James McQuillan thought, wow, this sounds exciting. Um, and he ordered two copies of the narrative for the previous two years. This was in the late 1850s. Um, and he was so amazed by what he read uh, that he thought if God could answer George Muller's prayers like this, then surely he could answer my prayers, particularly if my prayers are for spiritual things, because I want to ask for his blessing on the work I'm doing among children and young people and when I preach the gospel. So he talked to his, his friend who was called Jeremiah, great name, imagine being called Jeremiah. So Jeremiah and James began to talk about this. And Jeremiah too thought, well, if God could answer George Muller's prayers, he could answer our prayers. And so in September 1857, uh, James McQuillan, his friend Jeremiah and two other young men began to meet in this building. Uh, I think it still stands. Um, it's in a town called Kells in Northern Ireland and it was a schoolhouse. Um, and they say that on every Friday night through that autumn and through that winter, uh, those young men, just four of them, began to go and pray. Interesting for the young people to note this. It wasn't church leaders who started the prayer meeting. It wasn't, um, it wasn't some national organisation. It was just some young people whose hearts God had really set on fire. And on Friday nights, they would take a big piece of peat, which is what they used to burn um, in the fires then, instead of wood. They would each bring a big piece of peat in one arm and they'd carry their Bible in the other and they would come together, light a big fire, fire uh, in that schoolroom and they would pray uh, God would you light a real fire a spiritual fire in our hearts and would you uh, move across our our, our our town our city our the, the whole the cities around us and the whole of Northern Ireland they began to pray that God would do something new and their prayers began to be answered. One or two people became Christians. And then by the end of the year, a number of people had become Christians by the end of 1857. Um, and there were at least 50 people in that prayer meeting, that Friday night prayer meeting by the end of that year. Um, more became Christians and the churches in that area began to be full. And then these young men were invited to come and to um, preach and share what had happened to them in churches around Northern Ireland. And that none of them had ever preached before. And the first time they were invited, they all went together and they said, well, who's going to preach? And they decided that Jeremiah would do the preaching. He said, I'll preach if you guys will pray. 
And he later wrote after that first meeting, he said, well, I shouted and the boys prayed and God worked. And people were amazed by the spiritual fire that was in their hearts and by what was happening as more and more prayer meetings began to spring up across, uh, across Northern Ireland um, and the churches began to be filled with people. There were so many people starting to come to the churches that often they were beginning to have to meet outside because they couldn't fit the people in or they were having to hire out big halls in the city centres to try and get everyone uh, to, to, to allow access for everyone. This got into the national press and people began to write about it, people began to hear about it and uh, amazingly it, it, it then began to spread across into the rest of the UK um, and people heard well it all began in a prayer meeting so they began prayer meetings there was a, a, a revival of prayer meetings it became known in the end as the prayer meeting revival we need to always remember that we should never despise the prayer meeting remember that fire of god pentecost came to the prayer meeting um, there's a fantastic account that one guy wrote um, when he was in London at this time. This was at the beginning of 1860, and he wrote these words. He was invited to a prayer meeting in Islington, our little patch here, and he said this, I can never forget January the 9th, 1860, when at nine o'clock on a bitterly cold morning, the huge great hall in Islington, North London, was densely packed with people praying a simple prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we think this was an agricultural hall in Islington somewhere, packed with people, probably hundreds of people, praying for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. In London in January 1860, at that time, there were at least a 100 united prayer meetings. And by united prayer meetings, they mean um, prayer meetings where churches are gathering together. Um, this poured across the denominations. It caused the Christians to come together and not just stay in their little enclaves. Um, what had happened in Ireland then began to happen in the UK. The churches became very packed, um, so packed that they began to build new churches. Uh, they said over the summer of 1859 and the summer of 1860, many of the churches never closed their doors over the summer weeks. The meetings just went on and on with people in shifts coming in, sometimes through the nights as well, just because so many people wanted to come. And they were building churches, not in the hope that people would come, but they were building them because they couldn't fit the people in the churches that were already there. So much so, and this to me is perhaps one of the most remarkable bits of the story, that by the end of 1859, an Act of Parliament was passed allowing gospel meetings to take place in the London theatres on Sunday nights. So the rest of the nights they'd have the usual stuff going on in the theatres, but on Sunday night, um, from the end of 1859, they were allowed to preach the gospel. That They reckon that every Sunday night through that winter, there were 20,000 people in those theatres um, listening to these amazing gospel messages being preached by the preachers that God was raising up. Also at that time, they said that Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral and the Royal Albert Hall were filled, packed with people coming to hear these messages. This was what we would now call revival. There was an incredible turning back to God. It went out, this move across um, the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, there's wonderful stories told in Scotland um, where so much happened of the agricultural labourers who did, they worked terrifically long hours. Most of them worked from six in the morning till six at night, six days a week. And there's fantastic records of them and the factory workers running at the end of their shifts to get home, to change their clothes, to then go into the chapels and the churches to hear the messages. They would often stay there till midnight, go back to sleep and then go and do it again the next day. This this wasn't people being persuaded to come. This was people who just wanted to be there because God was moving on their hearts. In Wales, they called that year between 1859 and, 1960, uh, and 1860 the year of the right hand of the Lord. The, the chapels and the churches were filled. Again, they had to have outdoor meetings because there were so many people. But in Ireland, it was really the epicentre, uh, really of the whole move. Um, and they called it the year of grace. And at the end of the year, 
Um, it, it's estimated that around 100,000 people have become Christians in, in Northern Ireland at that time. And at the end of the year, some of the ministers involved got together and they said, we must never forget this. We must never forget what's happened. And they wrote a book, a wonderful book called The Year of Grace, all about what had happened. And one of the men in that says, he says, if I had just lived that one year, that would have been enough for me. All the other years of my life added up together will never mean as much as that incredible year of grace. And then, wonderfully, um, as the Holy Spirit was moving across this, this whole nation, um, revival began to come to Bristol, uh, close to where Muller was, just outside. Um, on August the 1st, 1860, um, Grattan Guinness, who was one of the great preachers of the 1859 revival, preached in Bristol and the numbers were so great they couldn't fit them in the churches, so they hired out halls and they couldn't fit them in the hall. And so in the end, over that summer, they had these open air meetings and on August the 1st, 1860, Grattan Guinness famously preached to huge crowds uh, in the city of Bristol and they began to meet in woodland areas like in the picture, also at the quayside and also out on the downs. And then finally, this revival reaches Ashley Down and it reaches the orphanages. Um, and Muller is, is so moved and so thrilled by what he's saying um, that, and, and he was, it was such a wonderful thing and so sacred to him that he wanted to write a book about what happened among the children. Uh, but when he prayed, he felt that God restrained him and didn't want him to. So he never wrote, wrote a full account of it. Um, partly because he wanted to protect the children. Uh, but what happened there began among uh, the girls, uh, and it began among the younger girls, the six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, who became intensely interested uh, in Jesus, began to ask the same thing that James McQuillan had been saying, we know about God, but we don't know him, um, and we want to know him. And in Flame, we've talked about how do you become a Christian? We've talked about these three T's, um, that you turn from your own way and you trust that Jesus has died for your sins and you take him into your heart. And for hundreds of the orphans, uh, that began to happen first among the younger girls, then the older girls, then among the boys. It happened um, over a period of just a number of days. Uh, Muller wrote that at least 200 of them uh, became devoted followers of Jesus. He said how they began to start uh, prayer meetings um, and of their own, a bit like we have at Carity Wood, um, teenage prayer meetings and children's prayer meetings. Um, and it was obviously an amazing time uh, for Muller and at the orphanage. This move of God uh, went on over decades, um, over the 1860s, 1870s, 80s, 90s, it went on um, right out across the country. There was also an amazing move of God in, <coughs> in America uh, and in other parts of the world. Um, and it, it triggered um, a sort of a, a long period of fiery, burning Christianity. Listen to this. When preachers like Spurgeon, Finney, Grattan Guinness uh, was seeing many thousands saved. William Booth and his Salvation Army uh, rose up. Hundreds of churches were built at this time, including, interestingly enough, Chalk Farm Baptist Church, the original building, Highgate Road Chapel, where we pray, St Luke's, where we sometimes meet with the others, perhaps once or twice a year, Kentish Town Evangelical Church in Bassett Street, the guys who we know there, um, and St Martin's in Kentish Town. These are just the local ones. They were all built during this extraordinary revival. There was also a huge missionary move out uh, with men like Hudson Taylor, C.T. Studs, the Cambridge Seven, um, hundreds and in the end thousands of young people mostly uh, from this country went right out across the world, um, inspired by what was happening in their own hearts by this fire of God. And it all fanned into flame again in the 1870s and 80s. Tygate Road Chapel, if you look at the building, was built in 1879. And um, that was when these huge revival meetings were being held by people like Moody and Sankey. Um, also Finney and people who were coming over uh, from America. And, and, and God was moving over those years in the most wonderful way. 
Uh, there were CSSMs were set up and beach missions, Sunday schools, day schools, huge amount of humanitarian work was being done by the Christians at this time to alleviate um, the suffering of the poor and of the sick. Um, this was Christianity uh, really flourishing during that time. And Muller, George Muller, lived to see all of this. How, how exciting for him. He must have heard the reports, he must have seen what was happening. Um, he's now nearly 60 um, and he's, he's not slowing down. I was, I'm, I was nearly 60 this week. I was 59, so I'm nearly 60. He's nearly 60. Sometimes I feel like I just want to start chilling, but he didn't want to. Uh, there's something he had wanted to do since he was a young man. And finally, in this last part, perhaps the last third of his life, uh, God allows him to do that. Um, and we're going to hear about that next week. Um, so we're now just going to pray. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Uh, you are the living God. You are the Holy One. You are the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Uh, we praise and worship you for all that you do and all that you've done. Um, and Father, we pray like those young men um, in that schoolroom in Northern Ireland all those years ago, we pray, would you would you bless the work that we seek to do for you? Father, they were praying that you would bless their Sunday schools, that you would bless their prayer meetings, that you would bless their preaching of the gospel. And we too pray this. Father, we pray that this fire that you put in their hearts, that in the end um, went out right across our land uh, and beyond. Father, that this same fire uh, would be in our hearts. Would you breathe, Lord? on the embers inside our hearts uh, and cause our hearts to be so turned towards you. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen.